Well, good afternoon, uh, good noon, uh, good morning to everybody who's joining us. Uh, really excited to have a large group today as we focus on a few of the exciting features in SQL Server 2022. And we will allow just a little bit more time for people to join and then we'll turn it over to Randy. Hang on one moment. Well, everybody's time is valuable, including Randy's. Uh, he is, of course, the founder of SQL Solutions Group, a Microsoft certified master, and we will turn the rest of the hour over to him as we dive into SQL Server 2022. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, just kind of the, the quick intro for those of you who have not attended one of our webinars before or who are um, familiar with us or not familiar with us. Um, SQL Solutions Group, we're a um, small consulting company, managed services, uh, focusing 100% on the Microsoft data platform. Um, we've been in business since 2010. I personally have been doing this for many more years than that, than maybe I, I would I care to admit. Um, but we do, we do SQL servers. We live and breathe SQL server all day, every day. Uh, and you can reserve your own judgments about what that means about us, but um, some of our services, check out the website, et cetera. Jason told you about me, um, so we don't need to dwell on that. What we're going to talk about today, um, obviously, you know, in a, a one hour webinar, discovering SQL Server 2022, um, you know, we're not going to have time to cover every new feature or everything that everybody might be interested in. So just kind of picking and choosing a, a few things um, to talk about. Um, I do want to talk about a, a couple of pretty interesting things with availability groups um, that we're going to get into. Um, we're also going to take a look at SQL Server Ledger. Uh, which has been in Azure SQL database for quite some time, uh, is now in the on-premises product um, in SQL Server 2022. And uh, it's blockchain-based cryptography to uh, determine the state of the data at any given point in time. Um, and so uh, it can be you know, very useful for auditing, things like that. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, there's there's more and more things being done in technology in general, but particularly in databases to say, hey, I don't even want a DBA or a sysadmin or a domain admin to be able to um, access or, or change this data, or at least I want to know if they did. So um, we'll talk about Ledger. Um, and then if we have time, um, We'll talk just briefly about some of the intelligent query processing improvements. Um, there's uh, some just new things related to feedback. Uh, we'll also take a look at parameter sensitive plans and kind of how um, Microsoft is taking a, a first first stab at, at solving the parameterization issue uh, within SQL Server. Um, also some some pretty exciting stuff for Query Store. Obviously, we don't have a ton of time in an hour, um, and I, I wanted to focus most of the demo time on the AGs because that's the hardest thing for you to do yourself, right? Uh, in terms of you know VMs and clusters and, and things like that. So we're going to do that. Um, Ledger, we've got a demo, but again, Ledger is something that you know on your laptop you can install SQL Server 2022 and play with Ledger, and that's the AGs are a little bit just more involved to to do like that. So. Um, the first uh, availability group topic is, is this concept of contained availability groups. Um, and this is really exciting. It is definitely a, a V1 uh, solution right now, and, and we're going to get into that and talk about some of what I see as the gotchas or, or things that people are going to run into with this. Um, but one of the you know Achilles heels of availability groups uh, you know, backing up, talking just a little bit of history, right? We started with database mirroring, right? For any given database, you could mirror that database synchronously or asynchronously to another server. 
uh, and there was a process that you could fail over manually, you know, fail that over. Uh, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a listener uh, and some people did stuff like that with DNS names. It was a very manual process. Um, it also, it was database by database, right? So uh, in many environments, we have multiple databases that are, that are all related to each other and need to be primary in the same place. So that brought us to availability groups, which allows us to have a collection of databases in an availability group. Um, that are read, write, or primary on one node. And we have copies of that being replicated to other nodes. Uh, we access it through a virtual IP name, a virtual IP and host name called a listener. We can have it automatically fail over. There's a lot of great stuff about it. And I, I would say at this stage, you know, AGs have been around for a while now. Um, gosh, 10 years. So yeah, a while. Um, we, in terms of just our the, the customers we work with, we work with more AG environments than non-AG environments. So it's it's definitely um, mature technology. The Achilles heel has been that anything that is instance level in your availability group, logins, um, everything in SQL Server Agent, you know, jobs, operators, um, alerts, um, things that are like linked servers, credentials, uh, anything that lives in the master or MSDB databases on your SQL server are not part of the availability group, right? So you run into things like um, I've got these jobs that need to run on the primary, uh, but I also have to create the exact same jobs on the secondary and, and do something so that when it fails over, the jobs will run on the new primary. And there's a lot of things you know we we've done. People do things like add a, a step one to every job that says, "Hey, am I the primary? If I am, continue to step two. Otherwise, complete the job, reporting success." That's on both nodes, right? But it's kind of a hassle to manage all that. Logins, right? Every login um, that exists needs to exist on all of the nodes in the availability group. Um, and if they're standard logins, they have to have the same SID, right? So if, you, if you've worked with availability groups at all, these are common issues that, that we run into and people have done various things to kind of you know, keep those in sync between the nodes. So in 2022, Microsoft came out with this concept of uh, contained availability groups. What happens in a contained AG is there will be AG specific copies of both the MSDB database and the master database, right? So, so jobs, um, you know, jobs, operators, and anything in SQL agent that's inside the contained AG will exist in the AG's version of, of MSDB. Any, you know, logins, credentials, link servers, things like that, that would normally be in master will be in the AG's version of master. Um, and we're going to look at this if, if that's confusing. The key point to remember is that this does not replace the instance level master in MSDB. And what you are connected to is going to determine what you see. So this is the part of it that I think is um, a, a potential gotcha, right? If you connect to the contained AG listener, Everything in your master database will be in the AG specific master. Same thing with MSDB. Um, you also um, only see availability group databases when you're looking in Management Studio, right? So um, in a regular AG, in SSMS, you're going to see all of the databases, whether they're in an AG, not in an AG. Um, if you have multiple AGs, on a, on a server, you're going to see all the databases, right? And you kind of have to look in the in the availability group to see which databases are are in which AG. Um, so in Object Browser at SSMS, you're only going to see the AG databases. You can still say use DB name or use a three part name um, and 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 use those databases. They're just not visible. Which brings us to you know what I see one of the two big limitations on this that, that people are going to run into. Um, the first is around tooling, right? 
Um, there's a lot of things that when you're working with a contained AG, if you're in management studio and you're used to using GUI to do something, um, doesn't work, you'll get an error, you try to script something. So, um, you know, you need to be accustomed to and 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 we promote this. We, we prefer this anyway, you know, really managing your environments with code, with SQL scripts, PowerShell scripts, however it is that you're doing it versus the GUI. Um, the other thing, uh, but that's related to that is, you know, there's an awful lot of code out there that says, hey, go to the master database and do this. Well, which master database, right? So everything from monitoring tools to Microsoft tools to our own homegrown stuff we're, we're, is going to have to account for that. There's also um, a laundry list of things that you can't do with a contained AG that you can do with a regular AG um, around, you know, uh, log shipping, replication, um, and there's there's a Microsoft doc. That, so, so just you just need to make sure that all the things that you do are supported in that availability group. OK, so with that, let's take a look at this. Um, what I have here is um, in my SQL Server Management Studio, I have a two node cluster, Lab 2022A and 2022B, right? Um, and if we look at that, um, in fact, let me go over to this, to the console itself. Um, right, so if I go to failover cluster manager, and I pre-created this environment, the, the cluster and a couple of AGs, because it does take some time to create and, and sync AGs, even with small databases. So we're kind of kind of do the cooking show thing where we'll, we'll look at how you would do this and then here's what it looks like, right? So I have, I've got my cluster, it's in Azure, so I've got a cloud witness, cluster name, and it, I actually see two AGs on here right now and, and we're gonna talk about those. Um, um, I have a contained AG and a standard AG, right? So, but to start with, let's go back to Management Studio and let's just kind of go through how you would create a contained AG versus a standard AG, right? This is one of the areas that um, the tooling is a little bit behind. So I created my contained AG with code, with SQL scripts. Um, that's going to be the way you're going to want to do it because the wizard, um, there's some pieces missing. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go on one of these nodes and I'm going to say I want to create a new availability group. And as I go through this, I give it a name, AG2, whatever. Um, it's on a failover cluster, and I just click Contained, right? Um, reuse system databases can be confusing. What this, the only reason this is here is if you had an AG already, a contained AG that had its system databases, and for some reason you removed that AG and wanted to put it back, you're just saying those system databases already exist. You don't need to create them so you wouldn't lose all your jobs and logins and things. So normally you're just going to say contained and you know, you're going to go through and you're going to you know, choose the databases um, and so forth that you want to use, right? So let's say I wanted to put this database in it and it's pretty much the same as, as, as normal um, in terms of, of this wizard or the process for creating an AG. I'm going to go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to go through the wizard. I'm going to generate a script. Um, so we'll go ahead and say automatic synchronous on both replicas. I'm not going to worry about a listener right now. Um, automatic seeding. Um, I was not able to get to work with the contained AG, um, but that may have been a, a function of my environment. Um, and so I typically do manual seeding anyway full database and log backup, give it a path, all of that. Um, this is all just the same way anytime you, you um, are creating an AG. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to click script and let's take a look at the script that it created because it did miss some things that are, that are important. Um, this is a SQL command script, right? So that we can connect to the different nodes. So this is very similar to what you will see um, 
when you create any AG, right? Um, a couple things here. In the create availability group command, notice it has contained, right? So that's just a, a word that you add to the create AG command, um, which tells you that it's going to be contained, where your replicas are, so forth, okay? Now notice what it did is it did the typical backup of the database we're adding to the AG and restore, backup and restore, wait for the replica to start communicating and you're done, okay? This will fail if we run it. What they haven't added in the, the wizard is that you need to add those other databases um, that get created um, manually, right, to the AG. Um, and so when I did this the first time, not realizing that I went through all this and it still wasn't healthy, I literally just went to the contained AG, availability databases, and said add database, right? Um, I'm on the wrong node for that, but um, that's okay. But you can see the databases that get created, right? So up here, okay, so we, we did all that. We created our contained AG. Up here, I'm connected to the node. And actually, let's go over here. Our contained AG is actually primary right now on 2022B. So let's go to the instance connection. So we're connected directly to the node name um, and see what we see on this guy. We see the contained AG. We see these two master and MSDB. And notice the name of those databases. It's the name of the AG underscore master, name of the AG underscore MSDB. You cannot control those. That's how SQL Server knows what it's going to be. And if you look in these databases, if you look at system tables and things, you'll see some of the same tables, right? You'll see sys jobs, you'll see sys operators. Um, master is a little bit more interesting because sys server principles isn't a name. Um, and so that's kind of that's that's a little bit different. But um, so I see and what we have, we have two availability groups, right? We've got our contained availability group on A and B um, that has uh, those three databases as part of it, the contained AG database and the two system databases. We also have a standard AG that has just this um, normal AG database in it. But when I'm connected to the instance, I see all of those databases. Um, if I am connected to the listener for the standard AG, I see all of the databases, right? Which has always been a little bit weird for people, right? Because I'm connected to a listener and I see my normal AG, which is this, and it says it's synchronized. That's the AG that I'm in. But I also see these other three databases that are in a different AG, right? If I, in fact, let's fail this over um, to the, let's see, that's standard, yep. We're gonna fail this over to node A as primary because that node actually has some databases on it that aren't in an AG at all. So the way to think of this is that when you connect to the listener for normal AG, it's really just another IP that will connect you to the primary, and you're going to see all the same things on that connection that you would see if you were connected directly to the node. And that's that's how it should work, right? We connect to the listener, it always gets us to the primary. If the role changes, um, we're in good shape. All right, so we've moved this now to A. So if I refresh my databases, I've got a couple of databases here that do not say synchronized because they're just standalone databases that are not in an AG, right? Okay, compare that to my contained AG. If I go to the connect to a connection to the listener for the contained AG, My databases that I see, my system databases are master MSDB and tempdb. These are going to be these two databases, right? So 
if I'm connected to the instance, this AG name master is what I'm going to see here. Same thing with MSDB. I also only see the, the, the user database that's part of the AG, right? So let's see practically what that means, right? Everything is going to be context based in what you're connected to. So here I am on 2022B, which is the primary for this guy. Refresh that. Right, so if I go in down here and I say, okay, here's my logins. And if I go here and I see my logins, one of the things you'll note is that most of the logins are the same. When you create that AG, it's going to create it with a copy of the instance level master database on the instance that you created it on, the primary. But that's not going to stay in sync after that, right? So it basically took all the objects that were in my master database, created its own master, but notice there's another login here called test-contained that I see in logins when I'm connected to the listener. I do not see it when I'm connected to in any other way, okay? So if I create a login here, connected to the AG listener, call it test two, we'll give it a blank password because we actually don't care about this login, don't do this at home. Okay, so I now have this login, test two, and this is a login like any other login, right? So I can go in, in here, I can assign it server roles, I can map it to databases. Notice the only user databases they're going to show databases going to show up are the ones in the contained AG. So I could say I want this to have a user there. It's going to create a user. That user is going to exist on the other copy of the database, of course. Um, but the difference is that, that that master database that this is all in is part of the AG and is being synchronized to the secondaries. So I don't have to create this login in multiple places, right? But the, the trick here is going to be I have to remember to connect to the listener to create the login. If I go and I create the login up here, and we call this guy test three, that login exists on B. It is not going to exist on A because we would have to create it on both nodes in a regular AG. And it's not going to exist. That refresh was too high in the tree. It's not going to exist in the contained AG, right? So this is a really cool feature. I'm actually really excited about this because this is one of the biggest challenges a lot of our customers run into with availability groups but it, you need to be very aware contextually of of where you're doing things right in in your databases um msdb works the exact same way right so if i go and i go to 2022b the actual primary node and i go to say sql server agent and i look at jobs i've got all these jobs right mostly maintenance jobs in, in this environment because it was created for this Right. If I go to my contained AG connection and I look at jobs, I don't see all those jobs that were created on each of the instances. I do see this job called test. Right. So that's a job that I created from within the context of this connection. Right. Um, which is actually kind of great because when you look at things like backup jobs, maintenance, things like that, there are jobs that you're always going to have that should run on every node that are unrelated to the availability group. But if you create your jobs that are dependent upon the availability group inside that AG specific MSDB database, now they're AG aware, they're, they're going to run 
only on on the primary. So um, that's contained AGs. I think this is a really cool feature. Like I said, I think it has the potential to solve a lot of problems. I, I think a lot of people are going to implement it, um, maybe without completely understanding some of these nuances and and potentially get themselves into trouble. So um, that is that's contained AGs. And then I always like to switch to teams periodically and just make sure if there are some questions. Um, let's see, we have, uh, will Synapse link be reviewed? Um, not Synapse particularly, and I, I, we're gonna talk about managed instance link in general, um, but, but not, uh, not on that. Um, and yes, they they are um, they are recorded. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's go back to our slides and continue. All right, the next availability group um, piece of this um, to talk about that's also you know pretty exciting is managed instance link. If you've got an Azure managed instance, uh, you can have it participate. Uh, in an availability group, in a, in a manner of speaking. Um, we've had this since SQL 2016, that you could extend your on-premises AG to Azure Managed Instance with you know, one-way replication, um, but it was a manual failover, and there was no way to fail back, right? So it was one of those things like, Great, Microsoft, you created something specifically so that we will migrate everything to managed instance. That's what it's for, is what that feels like, right? Um, so in 2022, we now have the concept of failover and fail back. It's still manual. Um, we also have read-only replicas. Um, so, so we have true HA, DR, and there's some interesting use cases for this, right? Not just for disaster recovery. It's a pretty easy way to to have you know um, your databases in a remote location right for dr um, but things like if you have workloads in azure that need a read-only copy of the data right um, maybe you're using azure data factory right to pull a bunch of data out of your database um, and populate various you know platform as a service data warehousing types of things um, this is an easy way to create a read-only replica in the region where your Azure services are and have that all happening locally, right? Um, the way this works under the hood is through a distributed availability group. Um, distributed AGs are, are quite interesting. Um, if there's interest, we might, we might do a webinar on them at some point, um, particularly um, as a method um, for migrating and upgrading availability groups with with next to zero downtime um, for version upgrades. That's it's a it's a it's a pretty cool technique for that. Um, but what happens and a distributed AG is is basically an AG of AGs, I guess is the best way to put it, right? So under the hood, what's happening with managed instance link is it's creating a distributed AG, which means your on-premise AG will be replicating all of its transactions to the managed instance um, and you'll have a read-only user database on that managed instance uh, that you can fail over to this is manual failover there's not a listener right this is not a true you know automatic failover seamless um, but you can fail over to it and more importantly you can fail back um, and then also the read scale out um, here's the bad news <laughs> I had a demo um, all prepared for this because I think this is a, a, a pretty interesting use case for a lot of people. Um, the uh, managed instance link for AGs um, is in a limited public preview, I think is what they call it right now. So you actually have to get it added to your subscription. So I did that, I reached out to Microsoft and I went to go deploy the managed instance in that subscription and we did not have quota for it. Um, so and that's my fault i should have done that further ahead of time but this stuff costs money and so i was just deploying the managed instance last night and it was too late to get that fixed so i, I unfortunately do not have a demo of this um but um 
we can potentially do that on another date uh, if there if there's interest. OK, um, before we kind of switch gears, um, just any questions on AG specific stuff with 2022 or, you know, anything AG availability based, um, perhaps from, you know, existing versions that you're like, hey, how does this work in 2022? Please put them in the Q&A. Um, you know, webinars are always just a, a little bit odd with the interaction and, and would love to hear um, what your thoughts are. SQL Server Ledger. Let me preface this by saying I'm not a, a cryptography expert by any stretch, um, but this is a, a pretty interesting feature that we've got some customers that have some interest in for things like um, SOX auditing. And so I wanted to, to cover it. Um, this right here is straight from the Microsoft um, documentation on how this works. Um, blockchain based cryptography. Any rows modified by a transaction in a ledger table is cryptographically SHA 256 hashed using a Merkle tree data structure that creates a root hash representing all rows in the transaction. The transactions at the database processes are then hashed together through an additional Merkle tree data structure, which forms a block. That block is then hashed again and turned into a blockchain, right? If, if that language excites you, more power to you. I'm not here to talk about how this cryptography works, right? At the end of the day, you have a hash that represents the state of the data in that transaction at the time the transaction occurred, right? Um, and the idea is that that should be immutable so that we can come back and look at the data and see it wins, who changed it, when they changed it, so forth. Okay. Um, the database ledger contains this concept of root hashes, right? And the real kind of power of this from a security and auditing standpoint is that there is a process that you can generate these database digests and, you know, every 30 minutes or however often you can actually store them as files in tamper proof storage. Right, something like um, S3 or Azure blob storage, right, with immutability policies, right, so that that data can't be deleted or, you know, an on premise, you know, write once, read many type of device, right? And so the idea is that at any point in the future, we can verify integrity by comparing hashes in the database to hashes in the off database storage. So even if somebody got access to your data files with the binary editor and went and changed the data, the hash would change, right? And you would know that, that something had happened. Okay. There are two types of tables that can be ledger tables. Append only, which are exactly what they sound like. You cannot delete, you cannot update. Um, these would be for things like auditing, right? Um, Updates and deletions from those tables are blocked at the API level. Even if you are a local admin on the box, even if you're a sysadmin, you cannot update or delete. All you would be able to do is drop that table, right? Which you could do as a sysadmin, right? But you cannot update or, or, or make any changes. Um, there's no history tables involved here as there is for updatable tables. Um, and so we'll look at that. Um, and so they're they're simple, right? Every row they're insert only. Every row it gets a gets a hash. Updatable ledger tables. This would be if I have a line of business application, OLTP, and so forth, that I want ledger to record every transaction that has happened to those tables. We would create an updatable ledger table. Um, when you have an updatable ledger table you will automatically get a history table associated with that that will keep track of all the changes um, to that updatable table. So, so the one thing that comes to, that, that people think about for that, wow, that's a lot of data, right? It could be a lot of data, right? Um, but we're going to look at both of these um, in the demo. 
Um, finally, you can actually have a ledger database. So there is a database property that you can create a database and say it is a ledger database, which means that database can now only contain ledger tables. If you try to create a table, you, you, you literally can't create a regular table in that database. If you create a table by default and don't specify the ledger type, it's going to be an updatable ledger table. Um, when you create ledger tables, there is no alter table concept for ledger, right? Only create. So that brings up an interesting point. Hey, I've got these tables in my existing database that are, you know, have billions of rows in them. How do I do this? You create a new table and you copy the data to it, right? So that's one of the that is one of the um, one of the downsides. Okay. All right, ledger verification. And I'm not going to get deep into this process because we just don't have a ton of time. Um, but one of the things that 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 um, I wanted to to talk about, oops, went backwards, is that no in database technology can truly be considered immutable, right? If I have access to the hardware, if I have access to the disk, I can I, if I can get to those data files, right? And that's where we get into things like TDE or always encrypted, right? Where the, the encryption key is not even available in the database, right? And so one of the things that I have heard stated by others at times is that Ledger makes it so that you can't change the data. And I, I don't want to go that far. Ledger makes it so that it's really hard to change the data maybe, but more importantly, this is more about detection than prevention, right? Um, verification is this process of we're storing digest of the hashes of the database hashes in an external location and I can use that to compare and see if anything has happened to my data. So um, all right, a couple of dynamic management objects related to this sys.database ledger transactions, sys.database ledger blocks. And every ledger table gets a system view, which is the table name followed or suffixed with underscore ledger. Um, and we're gonna look at all this in the demo. So let's do that. All right, I am gonna go over here to this node 2022A. Um, I have a database on here uh, called, Thought it was on here maybe it's on yeah called ledger demo um but i'm actually going to drop that database and, and we're going to start from scratch here so we're going to start with append only so we're going to delete this database and by the way most of this demo script is straight out of the microsoft documentation so that, like i said this is easy to try on your own on just a developer edition, SQL 2022. Um, I did not say close existing connections, and that was a mistake. So let's, let's look at, take a look at what we're going to do, right? We're going to create the database. We're going to create a schema called access control. We're going to create a table with three columns, employee ID, access operation description, and a timestamp. And we're going to say with ledger equals on, append only equals on. Okay, so I'm creating an append only ledger table. And where did we end up with our drum? It's probably, it's still there. So I am gonna do this. How about if we'll just drop table? Okay. So we're going to create this table like that, All right? So now in my ledger demo database, I have a single user table. Actually, I probably still have the updatable one too, All right? Notice that in SSMS, it tells me, hey, this is an append only ledger table, All right? Um, if I look at its columns, I see the three columns that I created, but I also see this ledger start transaction ID and ledger start sequence number. This is metadata that you're going to put in 
every ledger table, right? Whether you specify it or not, right? Notice it also tracks dropped columns, right? If I change the schema of that table, right? Okay, so it's an empty table. If I just query that table, I see an empty table with my three columns. I don't see these extra ledger columns unless I ask for them, okay? So I can do that by saying, select star and add those column names. Right? Um, or I can say select from object name underscore ledger. And that gives me that system view that includes my three actual columns as well as transaction ID, sequence number, operation type, and description. Okay, so just be aware of that. Okay, let's put some data in our table. So we're going to insert one row into our access control table. If I look at this guy, I see my data. But if I do this select star and I add those ledger columns, what I'm gonna see is a transaction ID associated with the ledger, right? So all of the rows included in that transaction would have that transaction ID, okay? Ledger start, whenever you see ledger start, that's an insert. Ledger end is a delete. A start and an end are involved with updates, right? To kind of see when you look in the history tables when we get to updatable, okay? If I look at the ledger system view, it includes the operation type was an insert along with the ID and the sequence number. And for an append only table, it's only ever gonna be insert, right? If I look at this database ledger transactions view, I can see all the transaction IDs that I've had since I created this database, right? Some of those were from last night, some of them are from just now. And what it has is it has that ledger transaction ID, the block ID and the hash, right? And it's going to record a ledger transaction for every transaction, okay? Let's try to update it. So I'm gonna try to change the timestamp for that row. Updates are not allowed for append only ledger tables. And again, I'm a sysadmin on this box, right? This is, this is flat out not updatable, okay? That's how append only works. Append only is pretty simple, right? Um, we don't have the history table, but we can do things like, you know, if we know we have the transaction ID in this ledger view associated with this, and I've got my database ledger transactions table, then I can go to the transaction. I can see when it happened and who did it, right? Who was logged in as well as the hash. So um, pretty, pretty cool technology. All right, let's talk about updatable tables, let's see. So for updatable, same thing, I'll go ahead and just drop the table to start with. Right, so we've got a customer ID, first and last name, and a balance, okay? This time, um, system versioning equals on, and then we're going to specify the name of the account table, ledger equals on, okay? In a ledger database, every table will be updatable like this. So um, we'll go ahead and do that. Notice what we have now, we have our account balance table that's empty. We also automatically have this account balance history table, right? So if I go and I look at my SSMS, I have account balance that says it's an updatable ledger. Notice the, the balance history table doesn't even show up here, right? It really is related to this table. So it shows up underneath it, right? And we can see all of the columns that we get, okay? Um, 
we also see you know drop tables so so notice those two tables that i dropped and recreated there are events here um, in sql server that that happened okay i also have my account balance ledger view that has those same columns transaction id sequence number operation type and description all right so let's add one row and we're going to see we have our row in the balance table there's nothing in the history table because nothing's changed the ledger table looks the exact same way as it did for append only now i'm going to do a second transaction this time i'm going to insert three rows in one transaction okay now i have all four of my rows in the balance table nothing in the history because history is only if a row changes if it gets deleted or updated if i look at my ledger i see that these are all inserts but notice the transaction id when i inserted one row the transaction id is 1101 when i insert multiple rows the transaction id is 1104 one transaction that's where the sequence number comes in. This was row zero, row one, row two of what got changed in that transaction. OK, so everything ties back to a ledger transaction, which has a hash associated with it, as well as you can see who did it. Okay. All right, let's go update a row. So what we're going to do if we look at our balances, customer ID one has a balance of 50. Let's set the balance to 100. Balance table looks the same way as it would in a non-ledger table. We have a new balance. But if we look at the history table, we have this historical record that says, hey, in this transaction 1101, this was inserted and the balance was 50. Right? If I look at the ledger table, I actually get multiple rows for this. That's what, this is why this is called a ledger, right? If you think of this like from an accounting standpoint, right? Where you have, you know, you don't ever delete anything in an accounting system, right? You have additional entries, right? So in the ledger, I have the row inserted as 100. Obviously two, three, and four haven't changed, but it has an insert in transaction ID 1101, where the value was 50, and it has a delete of that value 50 in transaction ID 1121. So that ledger table is actually a ledger of what has happened over in this updatable table over time. So that's how updatable works, okay? Last thing I'm gonna do is create a database as a ledger database. So what we're going to do is ledger demo two. And we're going to go to options and we're going to go down to is ledger database. True. OK. So I've got this ledger demo two. Notice it's got like this kind of little icon that shows that it's a ledger database. It has no tables in it, right? If I create a table, look what it did. It added the start and end transaction ID, start and end sequence number, right? It automatically made that table a updatable ledger table. Okay. So, um, and we can see that it's an updatable ledger. Right. If we were to script that table, we would see all that. We see the ledger history for. Um, this is why you don't ever want to create tables in the GUI, right? Because it does stupid stuff like this, right? <laughs> for the name as opposed to you actually doing it. But, um, and I haven't actually tried this. If we script this, how good is SMS, SSMS at this? Yeah, it's got the system versioning on history table. So then you could, you know, you could you could change you can also specify names for those columns those generated columns if you want to right so you don't have to use the system generated names um 
but that's ledger, right? It's um, here's here's the thing with ledger. Again, it's a V1 feature, right? And it has some limitations. And what those the main limitations are, um, if you want it to be the default for the database, that's a new database, right? So we have a customer that was excited about implementing this. And then, um, you know, we're trying to do this with existing databases. He's like, I have to create a whole new database, right? Um, that's for ledger database, but tables are the same way, right? So I cannot alter a table and add the ledger functionality to it, um, which kind of makes sense, right? Because the whole idea is that we have a ledger that has the, the entire history of this table from inception, and I wouldn't be able to turn it, want to be able to turn it on and off. Um, but what that means is if I'm going to ledger enable an existing table, I'm going to have to create a new table um, that's ledger enabled and copy the data to it, right? So Microsoft actually has a new system stored proc called SP copy data in batches. And when I first saw that, I was like, it's about freaking time, right? Because how many of us have written thousands of loops to batch copying data? right? Because we don't want a giant transaction, right? Um, however, this only works in the same database, same schema, right? So the syntax is literally this from this table to this table batch size. So useful if, you know, in this in this use case, I've got a database, I've got a table in it, I need to create a copy of it, create a ledger version of that table in the same schema and run this um, but you are going to have to copy your data into the ledger tables to, to ledger enable an existing table. All right, um, we have just a few minutes left. We haven't had, I don't think, any more questions. So uh, we have a quiet group today, which is fine. Um, I do have this in this intelligent query processing section that I added when I realized we weren't going to have the managed instance demo. Um, that I have actually done this in another webinar, which is why if you've seen it, um, you know, don't feel like you need to stay around. But there are some pretty cool, cool new features here. And, you know, we may do another webinar sometime just on intelligent query processing in 2022 and, and what, you know, some of those changes are, right? Um, but there's also kind of this uh, little bit of a uh, graphic from um, the documentation. But I thought it was kind of interesting that it just shows, you know, which of these intelligent, intelligent query process, I should, I, re I really should say IQP, huh? Uh, which of these features were added when, right? Starting in 17, 19, 2022. So quite a few new ones. I honestly don't have a lot of data on these yet because where that data is going to come from is production workloads. And um, we have a total of, of one customer who has updated one of their production environments thus far. So over time, we'll we'll start to to have some some more good data on that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, parameter sensitive plans is a V1 feature that's been added um, in SQL Server 2022, um, and this is you know Microsoft's attempt at giving us a a solution for parameterization issues. Um, I, I I do love the terminology parameter sensitive plans. Um, parameter sniffing is usually what this is called. Oh, this is a parameter sniffing problem, and it, it's it's a misstatement of what the problem is. What the problem is is that we have parameters that are different enough that executing that query with those parameters is going to need or want or have a different plan, right? Uh, and so this is caused by you know unequal distribution of values. OK, some people believe or have believed, hey, I, I had a parameterization problem and I fixed it with updating stats. And the fact is, no, you didn't. What you did is you evicted the existing plan from cache by updating stats <laughs> or rebuilding indexes or whatever. Right. There is an awful lot of, of problems that we see that the, the root of it really is a bad plan in cache. Or an, I don't even like saying bad plan. The plan that's in cache was good for a given set of parameters. It's not good for the ones that we have. And you know, we hear from people, oh, we reboot the SQL Server and that fixes the problem. 
or we rebuild indexes or, or you know, take these drastic measures um, because we just don't understand the root of the problem. So we also have um, some new feedback mechanisms on degree of parallelism, parallelism as well as cardinality estimation. Um, that is persisted in query store. And then finally, we have some um, pretty cool new query store things. Um, one are hints uh, that you can actually store a hint um, in the query store, um, which, oops, I, I'm going the wrong direction, uh, instead of in your code, and that will override what is in your code, right? Um, but basically, you just specify this query ID, query ID, and what you want the hint to be. Um, those who know me know I, I hints are one of the things that when I see them, when I see a lot of them, I start to ask questions because I think they're overused, but this is a better way to use them, right? Where it's not in my code that I have to deploy. It's something that I can, I can adjust in query store. And then the really exciting thing in query store for 2022 is query store for read only replicas, right? Um, you know, we have availability groups where we can do our reporting queries, ad hoc queries, you know, point our report server reports at a read only replica, which is fantastic, right? Get that workload off of the primary. But the query store, because it's a it, query store is part of the database and it's writable, exists in the database. We can't have a separate. So, so all those queries that are happening on the secondary are not in query store, right? So what they have done is for read only replicas, when you enable this, it's still gonna use the query store on the primary, okay? But the queries have a role and replica associated with them, right? So that in query store, you can see where this query was executed and get to that data. So um, that is, I, I have a demo for parameter sensitive plans. We're out of time, so I'm not gonna do it, but um, that's where we're at on that. So. Um, before we wrap up, uh, any questions? I don't see anything in the chat or Q&A. So um, feel free to, to post anything there uh, that you'd like to discuss. And um, we'll be doing our next webinar on May 17th. Uh, Rich Benner is uh, one of the newest members of our team, and uh, he is going to be talking about indexes um kind of a, a back to basics but also getting into you know column store and and some of the newer things that um that we either see not used or or misused so that's our our plan for our next webinar so thank you for your time i will hang out for a moment if there's any uh any questions thanks randy i've also added a link to register for that web, uh, webinar in the uh, in the chat, so you can easily get to it through there. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will share an email with the recording from today's webinar, and we'll repeat the uh, May webinar link in there as well. All right, it's twelve o'clock, so I'm going to let everyone get uh, get back to their day. Or it's to twelve o'clock Pacific time, I guess I should say. So have a great one. Thanks.